Welcome back to the podcast, everybody. We have already recorded this week's episode. We recorded it on Friday. And of course, over the weekend, we heard the very sad news that Murray Walker has passed away. So rather than just let the episode go out as it was, Andrew and I wanted to sit down this morning, Monday morning, um, and just pay tribute to him for a few minutes. Andrew, the, the post that you wrote uh, about him on Saturday evening when we heard the news has done exceptionally well over on Instagram which I think is a measure of the man, isn't it, really? It is, really. It's one of those things where, um, you, I mean, I felt the same way when Sterling um, passed away, that you think, oh, well, I really ought to get something out there. And then, so you sit down and you write something, and then, you know, 30 seconds after it's been posted, you regret writing it because you just <laughs> think it's dribble and doesn't begin to do justice to the man and everything else. But, um, yeah, people have been kind about it, and I think, you know, I, th I think in those circumstances, I think something probably is better than nothing. And, uh, you know, you and I just wanted to, you know, to celebrate the man's life as much as mourn his passing. Um, and, yeah, so we did. And, uh, yeah, and, and as you said, we just wanted to take this opportunity just to, rather than just write a few words, just talk about the man. Because on these podcasts, I mean, obviously, you know, you can see us um, and you can hear us and we can talk in a little bit more detail. Um, I mean, he, and he was just, I was just thinking, you know, when he was at, in his pomp, when he was at his peak in Formula One, I was trying to think what you'd need to remove from Formula One to do as much damage as removing Murray. And it's something like Ferrari, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, it, he, he, was, he was one of the pillars of that sport, uh, certainly to any of the audience that he reached out to across the world. Um, and he was as much associated with Formula One as Ferrari. He was much a part of the sport as Ferrari. And, uh, you know, I think we all uh, lost something when, whenever it was 21 years ago. I think he hung up his microphone for the last time. You know, by then, let us not forget, in his mid-70s. You know, and thank goodness, you know, they found eventually, you know, Martin Brundle to come along and do such, I mean, in a completely different way. Um, but Martin got out of the pundit's chair as sort of Murray's assistant and took on the main event and and was and was fantastic in that role but um you know there'll never be another Murray will there mm. yeah it's true the, lots of people commented in response to your post and you've seen it across social media as well I'm sure um people saying things like that voice was so distinctive and so exciting it it, it made the race much more dramatic and exciting to watch because of his energy his enthusiasm for it um so how did you, I think you wrote in your post that you last saw him um, in the pub a couple of years ago. Um, did you know yeah. him well? Did you, did you get to spend much time with him over the years? Yeah, I mean, I, I knew him pretty... I mean, I guess, like so many people in the sport, I got to know him when I was editing motorsport at the end of the 1990s. Um, I probably bumped into him once or twice before then, but I got to know him reasonably well. I mean, he was always, you know, because, you know, don't forget, this was a bloke who went to the Donington Grand Prix in 1938, you know, and, you know, so his ability to reach back in time um, and to be able to provide an opinion or a view about almost anything. So we just used to ring him up uh, and just say, Murray, oh, well, yeah, can you remember what happened on this day? You know, who was this bloke? Or what happened there? You know, who, what did you think of such and such? Um, and he was always there. He was always helpful. Um, he was a huge fan of motoring journalism, certainly, and motorsport journalism. And so, you know, I always found a bit embarrassing. He read everything that, you know, that we wrote back then. Um, and so, and he was always, you know, if there was a crowded room and Murray was in it, you were in it, you, you didn't have to pluck up the courage to go and talk to Murray because he'd find you and come and talk to you. And, he, and you just talk about motor racing. And he, he was just one of those sort of everyman characters who just, you know, as, as long as you shared the passion and you got it and he, you were what he perceived to be a proper person, he'd talk to anybody about it for, you know, as long as they wanted to talk to him. And, you know, in the summer of 2019, um, when I went to have, I went to have a one hour lunch with him, which ended up taking over three. And he was exactly the same. We sat down and he had a couple of pints of cider and we talked and we talked and we talked. And he was, he, he was just, you know, physically he was a bit more frail as, as, as you'd expect. I think he'd had a fall and damaged his hip or something. Um, and he certainly had a couple of sticks, but his, his mind was just like absolutely 100% mustard. Hmm. Uh, and it was all still there. Um, and the thing about Murray is we all think of him as being this lovely, enthusiastic, cuddly bloke. Um, but I don't think people realise just what a professional he was. Um, and actually, beneath that cuddly exterior was a very 
at times serious, very thoughtful man um, who got where he got. You know, you, no one can get to where he got just by being, you know, really into the subject matter. He knew mm. what he was talking about. Um, and, and the other thing I would say is that, you know, the Murrayisms and, you know, which he bore terribly well and so many people would tease him about it, be it personally and publicly and privately and, and so on and so forth. But I don't think people really understood just what the business was like. Even what commentating today, I've done a bit of it. I'm really bad at commentating, but I've, I've done enough of it to know how hard it is. You know, I've commentated for Sky on the Goodwood Festival of Speed, and you know you've got a running order, and you know which car's going to come up the hill, and there's something something completely different comes up the hill, and you've no idea what it is, but you've got to keep on talking. And that's just the sort of thing that Murray would just, that would have just been meat and two veg to him. Murray would sometimes have to commentate on races he wasn't even at, yeah, because there wasn't the budget to, budget to fly mm. him across. So he'd be sitting in a studio somewhere in London, looking at the same television feed as everybody else, commentating on the race. Sometimes he'd have to commentate on races that had already happened. As if it was live. So he'd be sitting somewhere, thousands of miles away, you know, trying to commentate on a race that had already happened and he already knew what would happen and kind of pretend that this is all like news to him. And you never knew. I mean, the man was a total professional. Mm. And it's why he used to get so wound up with James Hunt, who'd breeze into the box late, rip the mic out of his hand and just start, you know, waffling on. And, you know, I used to think that James and Murray was a fantastic sort of yin and yang. Um, double act. Um, but Murray found it very difficult because James just wasn't a professional in the same way that Murray was. And Murray didn't understand this need for a, another person in the box, you know, because he thought, well, I can do this, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. and have this sort of, you know, has been Formula One driver in there with him. He really, really resented it, the imposition. And obviously it ended up working really well. And, uh, and James and Murray personally got on terribly well, but professionally, because they were such different people. Um, yeah, he struggled. Mm. He, uh, apart from motor racing, he lived an interesting life, didn't he? I remember I spoke to him on the telephone once um, and he was very generous with his time, very forthcoming. And he explained that yeah. he used to compete on motorcycles. Um, and you, yeah. just, you just have to quickly tell the story uh, about the Sherman tank. Well, I mean, uh, this is absolutely true. I, I was just, this was actually, because I didn't know this before I had this lunch with him in 2019. Um, I think I'd asked him what his favourite circuit was, and he said it was Spa, um, the old Spa, you know, the old really scary Spa. Um, and oh, I said to him, well, when did you first go there? And he went, oh, God, 1945, I think. Mm. I went, Hang on a second, 1945? Yeah, I was in a Sherman tank. <laughs> he was commanding a Sherman tank, and it was the Battle of the Bulge, and this was, you know, this was Hitler's great end-of-war offensive. Um, and it couldn't have been more serious. And Murray was there in the thick of it, battling his way through the Ardennes. And, you know, people don't realise about that about the man, that, you know, he was a war hero. I don't think people realise just what a successful businessman he was too, in, you know, in the world of advertising. You know, if you're of a certain age, the phrase clunk click every trip to get people to do up their seats belts, it was just, it was just one of those phrases. I don't think anybody realised that it was Murray Walker who came up with it. Um, or, you know, again, you have to be a certain age to understand but if you are a certain age, the phrase opal fruits are made to make your mouth water is just one of those things that sort of accompanied people like me through our childhood. And it was Murray who thought of it. The only thing he didn't do, he was, he was credited with a Mars a day helps you work, rest and pay, play. And he, he was, I think he, he thought that he would love to have come up with that, but he didn't. But so many other things um, was all down to Murray. I mean, so in business and, you know, and in Formula One and then, you know, as a soldier, I mean, mm. he had so many lives. Um, and just because he retired, I mean, he never really retired. He was always popping up and doing stuff, wasn't he? Um, he never lost that enthusiasm. And I mean, just a, a, an incredibly rare and wonderful man. Um, mm. And, you know, he, he'll never be replaced. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's a sad time for us, really. Um, he lived in 97, which is a good old age, yeah. and he lived one heck yeah. of a life and leaves a great legacy, doesn't he? So, But he, he lived 97 good, well, I mean, I, I can't speak for him the last year or so, um, mm. because I haven't been in touch with him since lockdown, but I mean, he certainly had at least 95, 96 good years, and that's the secret, isn't it? Mm. It's not just making it to whatever you make, it's, it, it's, having a, it's being you know, fit and well and happy and healthy, and he was. Yeah, great, yeah. okay. Uh, well, may he rest in peace, um, and yeah. thank you for your memories, Andrew, and let's crack on with this week's podcast. Episode 51 of the Intercooler podcast, and we've got a fun topic for this episode. However, 51 is significant to us, Andrew, because 
it means the podcast is a year old this week. We didn't do a Christmas episode, so it no. is 52 weeks since we started the podcast. Oh, a year of you and I talking rubbish down the camera. And how many of those have we done in person? <laughs> Three. <laughs> and one of which hasn't gone out yet. Exactly. Blimey, it's not many, is it? It's um, not many. But we do hope that in the next year, um, we'll be doing lots in person. Oh, well, indeed. Hopefully we'll be allowed to actually meet up a bit more. Um, but I, yeah. I was just thinking back a year ago. And what I remember is that one of the topics we spoke about in that first episode was reviewing the new Land Rover Defender. And I, yeah. I just couldn't believe it had been a year since you first drove that car. It's bizarre. It still feels to me like a completely new car. Mm. Um, because, I mean, well, they're still rolling it out, aren't they? I mean, you know, I drove the 90 for the first time last week or whenever it was, week before last. I also remember about that first po podcast is you had the idea for it. And you come into me and said, why don't we do a podcast? And I said, well, who's going to be on it? And you went, well, you and me. <laughs> and I went, well, hang on a second. You know, why is anybody going to burn up any of their time listening to you and I talk nonsense about cars? And you said it would be fine. Um, and, so, so, and so we did this very much against my better judgment. And here we are a year later, 51 podcasts. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's been great, isn't it? It has been. It has been good. And people are still listening. So thank you all for sticking with yeah. us. We appreciate it. We're finding new, um, new listeners all the time as well. So welcome if you've not been with us all that long. Um, the, the, uh, I was just thinking about this this morning, this sort of one year anniversary episode. And I, reflect, I thought back 12 months. Wow, we had no idea what was coming our way, did we? In terms of the pandemic, I, I honestly thought that we might be in lockdown for three weeks and then life would be back to normal. So naive. Well, I can remember, there were, to be, I, mean, I can remember our glorious leader saying, oh, we'll be on top of this in 12 weeks. Yeah. It's just 12 weeks. You just got, I mean, but that actually, that was, that was a bit later, wasn't it? I think that was right at the end of March when he said we've got a lockdown now. And so mm. we went to total lockdown, I think, something like March 23rd. And he said, don't worry, we'll be, we'll be done with this in 12 weeks. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And I still can't get a haircut. Um, all right, well, let's crack on then. So we have got a fun, episode, a fun subject for this episode of the podcast. We're talking about fast four doors. So sports saloons, a nice mug, and super saloons. Thank you. Um, <laughs> there's plenty to, to discuss here, why they're so compelling, which ones we like, perhaps which ones we don't like, um, what the, the, the sort of foundational, fundamental recipe is for a good one. Um, what yeah. we're not going to dwell on too much is the new M3. Uh, we've both driven it. It's a big topic, but we have spoken about it, um, it for uh, an episode of the podcast that will go out quite soon. Um, but to get us underway, let's have a think about why fast four doors are so compelling, why they're so interesting. I've got a theory here, but I want to, I want to hear your, your response first. Fast four door cut. Well... I mean, if you are of a certain age, um, so you're in the, if you're lucky enough to be in the pre-crossover SUV <laughs> generation, um, it was kind of the best of everything, wasn't it? It was, you know, here was, it was the kind of car that you could actually think about, you know, getting in yourself because it worked on both levels. You know, A, it, they, were, they were fast and they were fun, but also they had space. So you could go and, you could go and knock about in them. Um, and so what that meant was that they were usable. And as I've said on this podcast and umpteen times elsewhere before, you know, the amount of enjoyment you can get from any car is however much fun it is to drive, multiply the number of times by the times you get to use it. Uh, and that's the crucial thing, isn't it? You know, mm. these, they, we know, you and I know all sorts of wonderful cars, which when you get in them, in the right conditions, on the right roads, or even on the right track, are wondrous. Um, there are rather few uh, that do that, you know, from the moment you get into them, regardless of the weather, you know, which are just nice things to be in. Um, and yeah, I'm sure we'll be talking about them, but you know, I can remember about, I can remember the sort of fast saloons and the super saloons from, you know, my formative years when I was like a sort of teenager or whatever and really getting into cars. And, and to me, that was the appeal. The appeal was you could do anything in these. Hmm. It just doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's raining. It doesn't matter. You've got to go and sit on a motorway. You can drive across Europe. You can go to the shops. You can go around track. You can do anything you like. Um, so that's, that, that's it to me. What it's about a, you? Yeah, well, I mean, you make a very good point. It's, if it's your everyday car, you get to enjoy its performance and its handling all the time. Um, all the and, time. And it's not going to be as sharp as a sports car comparatively, but it, that hardly matters. You might be giving away a few degrees of steering precision or whatever, but you've got a car that's enjoyable to drive, that's fast, 
and you're using it every day. So, yeah, I mean, that's why they're so compelling, isn't it? And I, I think also someone might put me right, you might put me right here, but I suspect that it was the, the fast four door that was first to combine usability with performance and handling. I suspect that Absolutely. was the first genre of yeah. vehicle yeah. to bring those two things together, that yeah. performance in an incongruous yeah. body. And from yeah. there, we've spun off to all sorts of, um, down all sorts of other avenues. We've got performance estate cars, performance SUVs. We've got even performance MPVs and performance pickups. So from th th that first sort of kernel of an idea of combining performance with usability, it spun out all these other different opportunities, possibilities. Yeah, and, you, and, 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 and even hot hatchbacks. You know, yeah. that's just doing the same thing, isn't it? That's true. I, 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 thought of, I thought of another thing, which shows you how much we plan these podcasts in the front. <laughs> I literally thought, this, thought of this while you've been talking to me. The other thing that I loved about them, and I use the past tense because I don't think you can usually say, you can say the same so much today. I loved the incongruity. Of the, I loved the fact that these cars, and I'm thinking particularly about you know, things like early BMW M cars, an E28 M5. You just see it and you just think it's just another 5 Series. Mm. A high spec um, one maybe, but yeah. High spec one, yeah. But I mean, really, if you didn't notice that it had things, like, I don't know, I think they had like body coloured mirrors and obviously they had alloys and they had badges on them, which you could take off. Yet most people wouldn't know. And yet it's got this 286 horsepower straight six in it, which back in you know the 1980s was plenty. Mm. Uh, and I just love that wolf in sheep's clothing um, aspect to them. And these days, of course, we live in a world where if your car isn't making a statement about you, why would you have the car? Um, whereas, you know, the cars that I loved and still love really are the cars that make no kind of statement at all. The, the, the under the radar cars. Mm -hmm. And there is no kind of car which is more under the radar and better at that than the high performance saloon. So there you go, that's another reason I love them. So I'm presuming that you feel a little bit dubious about the new M3 and the way it looks. Not under the radar, not subtle. Well, I, I, yeah, well I, 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 as I think I've said in a, in a podcast yet to be broadcast, I think, it's, I think I said it's a good car for somebody else. Mm. Okay, well, let's leave that there. Um, is there a difference to you between a sports saloon and a super saloon, or do they just describe the same thing? Uh, there, there's certainly a difference, isn't there, between a sports car and a supercar. Hmm. Um, hmm. Interesting. The entire definition of what a supercar is something we've been rattling around for decades, and I'm not, still not sure we've quite got there. Um, but I guess the same sort of rules apply. I think, you know, super means bigger, more expensive, possibly more luxurious. I mean, you know, I, I think it's just one of those things that you can analyse it and, you know, roll it over and over and over. But in fact, the truth is, you know it when you see it. Mm. You know, a, you know, an M3 is a sports saloon. Um, you know, an M760 Li is a super saloon, mm. and you know, and you can say, well, of course, it's bigger, it's faster, more powerful, it's more luxury. Blah, blah, blah. But I mean, in fact, you just need to look at it and go, what is it? And and and, and it's always pretty obvious to me. What do you, you, you think the same? Yeah, well, I think the sort of most broad brush definition would be something M3 sized is a sports saloon, something M5 and up is a super saloon, but you're quite, you can't put numbers on it, you can't put dimensions on it or weight figures on it, no. because these things are constantly well, you can, evolving. But, but you, get t you just get tied in knots, and it's exactly yeah. the same thing with the supercar argument, because people will go, ah, yes, but what about the such mm. and such, because there are always exceptions. Yeah. Um, and, and so the trick is just not to get too bogged down in this stuff, because ultimately, you know, these are, these are cool cars, and that's all that matters. It's equally tricky to pinpoint the earliest examples of these cars, whether you're talking oh, sports yeah. saloons or super saloons. But we can have a go, can't we? Because that's half the fun of it. Um, I think you're gonna propose what might be the first super saloon. Um, I just wanna to talk yeah, to you definitely. briefly about what might be, what could be, just, just a suggestion, the first sports saloon. Um, I was reading up about this last night and I found that in 1934, Rover built something called the Speed 14. And they put speed in it, so, in the name. So that has to be a, a performance car of some description. Um, it was a four-door saloon, manufactured between 34 and 36, aluminium bodywork. Uh, let me just quote this to you. The speed engine had three semi-downdraft carburettors in place of the single downdraft instrument, specially streamlined ports and manifolds, and a high compression cylinder head, uprated wheels and brakes as well. That sounds like a sports saloon, doesn't it? 
It was. I've never heard of it, and you know, and, and I, I kind of, you know, I, I, I live and breathe in that era. Um, hmm. I should have heard of this car. I think only. But I haven't. Only hundreds were built. Um, but it yeah, was timed. But it's probably it, all the all the more reason to have heard of it, frankly. Well, maybe it was timed at Brooklands in 1935 <laughs> at 82.57 miles an hour. That's clipping quite al- rapid. Clipping along. Yeah, in the 1930s. It had 54 horsepower, which I thought must have been a mistake, but 54 seems like quite a lot. Best part of 100 quite years ago. Quite a lot. Yeah. Quite it's a not a huge car. amount, even by then. Really? Okay. But, yeah. I mean, that's 1934. Another example, much more recent, relatively speaking, Jaguar Mark II, late 50s. Yeah, definitely. 3.8 yeah. litre straight six, 220 horsepower, 125 miles an hour. We have spoken about these before, haven't we? Not 68 and a half seconds. Yeah, that 220 horsepower, I think that's a gross rather than a, um, a DIN rating. So it's probably reality a bit less than that. But even so, compared to yeah, anything else. And the other thing about that car, it was quite affordable. Mm. Um, and you know, they did that car with a 2.4 litre engine, which you really didn't want. Or a 3.4, uh, which is actually pretty good. You'd have to drive a 3.8 pretty hard to get away from a 3.4. Um, manual box, automatic gearbox, um, yeah, you know, beloved by bank robbers and Oxford de- detectors uh, alike. A uh, you know, very cool thing. But Yeah, and you can see the sort of lineage from that to something like an M3, can't you? It's, it's as we said before, it's that usability, the slightly yeah. incongruous body shape and performance. Um, yeah. It's, the, it's fundamentally the same set of principles. Oh, straight through to an XFR, isn't it? I mean, there's mm. absolutely direct line of sight between those two. Uh, yeah. It's exactly the same kind of car, just half a century apart. Yeah. And if we want to, yeah. if we want to modernize these, these things even more, we can come into the 80s. And one of the early cars of its type was the Mercedes 190E 2.316 valve Cosworth, um, because it was a homologation special for DTM. Um, it was so heavily uprated over the standard car. Um, and in terms of not just power, but uh, aero and um, steering and suspension and had a LSD as well. And then there were the Evo and Evo 2 models. So maybe that's closer to the blueprint of, of today's cars. Um, but I, I think probably you have to go all the way back to the 30s to figure out where this, this type of vehicle um, came from. And I know you're going back to the 30s for you, what you're yeah, proposing I mean, is the first super saloon. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the thing is, you know, back in the 30s, and in fact, back in the 20s, um, you know, don't forget the world was a completely different place because you know, when you went to, you know, a, a prestige car manufacturer and bought a car, what you actually bought was a chassis with an engine in it. Mm-hmm. You then go somewhere else completely different to go and get its body created, which is why there are all these amazing bespoke cars out there. So you go to, you know, Gurney, Nutting or Mulner or Park Ward or Vandenpla or Freestone or whatever, lots of these guys. Um, and so all you needed was, you know, the basis of a fast car and then you could turn it into a super saloon if you wanted to. So, you know, you can get, I mean, so the, the, the brand I'm going to talk about, um, the market I'm going to talk about is Bentley because they were the kind of like the absolute governors of this business. Um, and you could go and buy, in 1922, you could go and buy a three litre Bentley um, and put a four door saloon body on it. Um, and it would blow the doors off anything else that was out there. And that, but that wasn't a Bentley model. What you bought was a three litre. You then decided that you wanted it to be a saloon. Um, but the car, the super saloon I'm talking about is like is the ultimate Bentley, which was the eight litre, of which they only built 100 before the company went bust in 1931. But this was a car, they guaranteed that whatever body you put on it, however big, however heavy, however under, they guaranteed it would do 100 miles an hour. Um, <laughs> Pretty much anywhere, okay? And this was a car with an eight litre straight six in it. It would have had at least 200 wow. horsepower. Um, and you know, and these things wouldn't just do 100 miles an hour, they would get to 100 miles an hour and they would stay there. Now, if you think about the kind of normal car, the kind of the Ford Focus of the era, which is probably an Austin 7, you know, that's gonna be, you're not gonna wanna be doing 45 miles an hour in that. <laughs> so you're talking about a car which will easily hold a speed which is double the top speed of the sort of car that most people are driving. And if you if you extrapolate that forward today, you're talking about a car with a top speed well into the 200. So you're talking, you know, Veyron, Chiron, so that sort of thing. But they had this, but you could do that in total luxury. So W.O. Bentley himself had one. 
Um, and what he liked doing was he would get the, I think it was the New Haven Dieppe Ferry, okay, and get off that. And he would drive it to the south of France without having to turn the lights on. <laughs> now, if you think about that, okay, even if he did it in the middle of the summer, there were no auto routes, mm. yeah? And he would get to this thing, you know, he would get off this thing in the morning and he would get out of it in the south of France. And he would have just sat there doing 100 with his massive Baker-like steering wheel, uh, thundering down these roads, scaring the life out of the locals. Um, and and presumably know, going through towns and villages as well because they wouldn't have had yeah, bypasses. But, oh God, no, nothing like that. Nothing yeah. like that. He probably didn't lift too much. Um, <laughs> and, you know, just grabbing, grabbing fuel where he could. Um, yeah, and this was 90 years ago. Um, mm. I mean, honestly, if, if he had come up behind you then and you'd just been in your, whatever you would have been in, your little Fiat or Peugeot or Citroen or whatever, that would have been at least, if not much more remarkable than, you know, tootling along and finding someone bearing down on you at goodness knows what speed in a Chiron. Mm. Um, yeah, so, I mean, so, so to me, that's kind of where it, where it came from. Um, the sort of super saloon, but but these were cars that were, I mean, they were so unaffordable. They were so you know, they, they, you know, you almost had to be royalty to to have one of these things or a captain of industry or whatever. But even so, you know, I think that's probably where the idea started out. Have you ever tried to replicate that journey through France in a Bentley? No. It's a good story no. there. <laughs> we'll well, I mean, there, okay, there is the other, there is the other story, but I mean, it was uh, and actually, although. Am I, am I going to get into the blue train story? Oh, briefly, okay. So, Wolf Bonato, chairman of Bentley, um, had a bet with someone that he could beat the blue train. The blue train was the way that posh people travelled from, um, from, well, actually from Calais to the south of France. Um, and he had a bet that he could beat the train back to the UK. And so he left at the same time, he left south of France, I think can, at the same time as the train. And he was in his Bentley. And everybody thinks it was this amazing gurney nut in coupe because, that, the, because there was a picture of uh, a painting done of this car thundering along with the train beside it um, but it wasn't it was another car uh, it was a speed six um, but it had a much more saloon type body on it and he not only beat the train by the train time the train got to Calais he was in his club in London in this what thing. <laughs> yeah he was wow, in his club in London the by the time the so he absolutely stuffed it um so Bloody yeah, hell. so I, I and and I think people have recreated that journey. I, I haven't, but um, yeah, if anybody wants to, I'm very up for it. <laughs> well, that sounds to me like a super saloon. I have to say, um, yeah. people often talk about <clears throat> the original M5 perhaps being the first super saloon, but then, well, BMW did uh, the 535i based on the E12, the previous five series in 1980. That had 215 horsepower, three and a half liter engine. Just looking here, also had sports suspension, Recaro seats, the steering wheel from the M1, close ratio transmission, LSD, larger brakes. That sounds like the recipe for a super saloon to me. Um, and then we could go back a bit further as well. Things like the Jaguar XJ12, big, big, big V12 engine in, a, in an XJ. And then the Mercedes 300 SEL 6.3. Uh, huge thumping V8 in a big luxury car. I do th think, though, that just performance isn't enough to qualify as one of these I cars. Agree. I think there has to be it's a level be, of dynamism as well. Yeah, fast is jo fast on its own is not enough, is it? No, I don't no. think it is. They uh, have to. They and have that's to, why. Uh, uh, that's, sorry, that's why something like a six point nine liter four fifty SEL, wonderful luxury mm. car, fabulous thing, driven mm. one, um, absolutely terrific. But that's not a super saloon, not to me. No. No, and a, a modern modern Phantom has got bundles of power, and it'll clip along yeah. very nicely indeed, but it's not a super saloon. Um, no, it's a limousine. It's a limousine, exactly. Different thing. Um, what about the... <clears throat> just give us a moment on the Lotus Carlton, just because it's so cool. Um, that, that was one of the cars that elevated the category to whole new heights, controversially, didn't it? Um, it was just so fast, so powerful for its day, and people looked at it and thought, well, that's a saloon car with supercar levels of performance. And I think a lot of people just thought it was completely needless, didn't they? I was never that knocked out by it, which I know is not a fashionable thing to say because I know that everybody goes nuts over them now. But, um, okay, so, I mean, at the time, um, there was obviously the um, E34 M5, 
um, mm -hmm. which was just a beaut I mean, to me, the almost the the epitome of what I want a super saloon to be, because it's exactly what you were talking about. It wasn't just fast; it was fabulous to drive. It was beautifully balanced. It had that motorsport engine in it. Um, it was it was quite light. It was just a lovely, lovely thing to um, to hoon about it. Now the Lotus Carlton came out. It had much more power. It had this 3.6 litre twin turbo straight six uh, motor in it, which gave I think 377 horsepower. Um, you know, it would do over 170 miles an hour. I did 160 in it at Millbrook. I mean, it scared the life out of myself in it. Um, but no one had ever recorded a 140 to 160 mile an hour time at Millbrook. And because I was young and stupid, I just thought, well, I'll go and do that. Um, and I've very nearly been the car. I so oh, nearly been the car. Um, on the ball? Because I basically just... No, no, on the mile straight. On the, on the mile straight. Oh, my God. Oh, no, it would have been easy on the ball. No, right, no, no, okay. no, no. I was, I was doing it on the mile. So, so, um, so, so there was this... At Millbrook, there is a straight, which is exactly one mile long. And at one end of it, there's very tight banking. And at the other end of it, there's kind of like a much shallower, longer bank section. Now, you can choose. You can come thundering off the, the quick banking, but then you've got a very, very tight turn at the end. Or you can come quite slowly off the slow banking, <laughs> um, but at least you've got a bit of space here. So that's what I decided to do. Um, and I kind of got to the bit, the absolute last breaking point. Um, and I was doing 159. So I just thought, I'm not going to break. And I was so far past the last point where you can break when it hit 160. And I was on the ABS all the way up the banking. And there was, there's quite a tight turn at the top of it. Um, and that was all right because uh, I'd, I had the thing to myself. So I knew there wasn't going to be anything to come the other way. And I somehow got through the turn. But at the end of it, there was a little roundabout which was public, and there could have been anything going round about it. And I knew I'd be able to get round the roundabout, but I wouldn't be able to stop for it. <laughs> so I knew that if anything was coming round the roundabout, the game was up. It was all over. You know, New Carlton's, please. Um, and luckily there wasn't. So um, that's how I did it. But that's it's one of the most stupid things I've ever done in a car. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, I just didn't think... It was really fast. It was much faster than M5, let alone the, um, the 500E. Do you remember the... Mm. Um, the W124 500, which is just mustard, um, <laughs> but never sold with right-hand drive, uh, built by Porsche, fabulous car. And they were kind of the three great German super saloons at the time. Um, and, you know, I like them almost you know, in, in reverse order. The Carlton was the quickest. It was the one I liked the least. And I love the M5. And, and now I've driven a couple more recently. That 500E was just a beautiful thing with that five litre V8 in it. Um, so classy, so solid, so well built. And the Carlton, yeah, I mean, interesting. I mean, it did, as you say, it absolutely raised the game. It was quicker than any four-door car that there had ever been up until that stage. But as you say, just being fast isn't quite enough. And to me, the handling just wasn't sufficiently well resolved. They were a bit soft. They were a bit, they just didn't steer as nicely as, 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 the, as the German car. So not quite my thing i'm afraid there you mm. go. i've said it mm, fair enough it's interesting to think about where we are with <clears throat> super saloons today because something like a high spec m5 or an e63s you could drop 120k plus on one of those without really yeah. thinking and that's yeah. just maybe i'm out of touch but that just seems like a phenomenal sum of money to spend on well, something that isn't if you think low about volume. what it's going to be worth a year later well that's the thing yeah yeah. Yeah. Pennies. Um, <laughs> I mean, they, they all shed. Oh, I don't know. I'd have to look it up. But two years plenty. down the line, you'd, you'd pick it up for yeah. much, much less yeah. than that original sticker so, so, price. So, 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 so what you have to do is either do that, pick one up for a lot less, or if you are going to go the whole hog and just get it, you know, you just have to keep it forever. Mm. Um, and, the, and, and then just enjoy it. Um, because, you know, you're going to take so much pain in the short term on one of those cars, aren't you? Yeah, you really are. Um, I mean, apart from being very expensive now, these are 600 horsepower cars. They've had to go four-wheel yeah. drive just because all that power and torque through a rear axle in a saloon body, which isn't optimized for things like weight distribution and traction, you, you, you just need front drive shafts to make any sense of it. Um, but they're also over two tons, these things now. Uh, yeah. do, do they start to lose some appeal, do you think, when they get that heavy, that fast, that powerful? Are they... Do they cease to be 
sort of interactive driver's cars and just become these thumping autobahn machines. I mean, some are better at it than others, aren't they? I mean, I didn't, I mean, I actually, I like the current M5. I think that's a bit, that, that was a good, because it, did, it does feel a bit more, for want of a better word, m 5 um, than the previous one. The previous one, just uh, I just didn't get on with that at all. Um, but the current car, I think, is quite good. I've always had a soft spot for those Mercedes. Um, mm. I mean, partly because of that ridiculous four-litre V8 they stick in them, um, which I think they're going to continue with um, in those cars, if not the C-classes, for a while yet. Um, and... Yeah, I mean, I mean, I still think they're great cars. But yes, I mean, clearly anything that is, you know, over two tons is going to come with inherent problems with it. But I guess at the same time, because you're looking at to do other things, you are looking for, at it to be quiet and to be comfortable and to and do all that sort of stuff. It matters a bit less. Um, but, you know, I don't know what, you know, the E34 M5 or the W124 500E are talking about what they would have weighed. But they probably, what do you think they would have weighed? 15, 1600 kilos, something mm. like that? Yeah. You know, getting on for half a ton lighter than, you know, their modern contemporaries. Um, and, yeah, I mean, that's, that's not great. But, you know, again, that's just me saying this. I think if you spoke to people who actually go out and spend their own money on them, unlike you mm. and me, mm. they would say, hey, you know, uh, you know, I want a car that feels luxurious i want mm. a car that feels absolutely solid i want a car that is groaning in all the gadgets and yeah of course i want it to have 600 horsepower and to go really fast as well but that on its own is not enough because people want other stuff from these cars which which probably trouble you and i rather less so you know i do understand why they are the way that they are but no absolutely given the choice of course i'd rather they were you know would you rather it was two tons and 600 horsepower or i don't know 1750 kilos and 500 horsepower you take yeah, the 500 horsepower car you, all the time, wouldn't you? You would. It'd be no slower, um, and it'd be better to no. drive in many other ways. But <clears throat> I mean, we have to we have to confess, we have to admit that that E63 and the M5 as well. They are alarmingly good to drive on a decent road. They they've figured it out. These companies they figured out how to control all that weight. And no, it's no sports yeah. car. But that E63, you can really honk along in that thing and have a pretty good time. Um, yeah, you can. But, I mean, so there, but there are a couple of other things going on here because, you know, for instance, you know, A, well, first thing is, is that, yeah, you, you kind of honk along and they have worked out absolutely how to control their bodies up to about, you know, eight or nine tenths. Yeah. And you can put them on, I'd put, stick them on a track and skid them around and do all that stuff and, that, and that's fine too. Um, but these aren't fine handling cars, are they? You know, mm. these aren't, no. you know, um, sports cars. But, you know, they're, they, I mean, they're, they're almost like, it's what I call dancing bear theory, okay? You know, <laughs> if there was a dancing bear and, and back in the days of the circus <laughs> they used to have these things and you weren't that troubled by the quality of the dance were you? it was the fact there's a bear dancing um, and you know the fact that you you know that you can hustle a you know an E63S down a decent road and it actually is pretty good you're sitting there thinking wow and you're not worrying too much about the fine nuances of the thing but I think the point I would make is where they are amazing to drive is compared to the equivalent uh, 600 horsepower SUVs mm. um, oh, because yeah. you, know, you might be able to manage the weight reasonably well with you know good suspension location and um, active roll control and you know trick dampers and everything else but the moment you start putting your CAG up there it's a whole different world of pain um, mm. and you know to me that's why these cars still have a genuine appeal because they're just so much better to drive than what people increasingly regard as the, as the alternative. Well, the mainstream alternative now. I'd just much rather drive, you know, uh, an E63 than a, a GL63 or whatever they're calling it. Mm, yeah, yeah, I agree with you there. Um, well, let's think about some of the <clears throat> less obvious, slightly left field uh, sports saloons and super saloons, the fast four doors. Um, because there are some interesting cars in there. Jaguar have knocked out a few. The, the XFR at times over the years has been a really quite bloody impressive car, um, yeah. partly because it's got that thundering what? supercharged V8 in it. Yeah. And they've, yeah. they've been quite, pretty quite good un, to drive. Quite underrated. Yeah. Mm. Quite underrated, I think. Um, yeah, I mean, there were, I can't remember when they first got a diff in them, 
But there was a time when mm. you, you know, the, the, the Jaguar were being, I don't know whether they are being purists or they are just trying to save money or whatever, but they, but they refused to put LSDs in these cars, which, you know, even back then, had, I don't know, thick enough 500 horsepower. And it was, you know, every time you, you know, if you, if you turn, the, either you come out of the corner and either the thing would just cease to move because it had no traction <laughs> at all. Or if you turn the trick off, you just look in the mirror and it, it would just be embarrassing because there'd be so much smoke. So I've, yeah, I've, you know, I've always liked those cars. I've always liked those cars because they've, I think Jaguar tried, and in fact still do try hard on the most to give their cars a certain sort of dynamic feel and to make them feel mm. um, consistent and to, and to handle a certain way. I mean, Jaguars don't tend to understeer. Um, mm. And that's something which they engineered in their cars. You know, that goes back to sort of Norman Dewis in the 1950s because he just hated cars that did that. And so he defined how a Jaguar should handle. And I think they're still trying to set them up that way today. Um, oh, that's interesting. Obviously, at a different level of grip and everything else, but um, yeah, yeah, so no, nice car. And they never like their cars to really thump along the road. I guess there are some exceptions, no. exceptions, but um, yeah, they tend to ride in a relatively fluid way. Um, yeah. What about the <clears throat> what about the the Lexus Sports and Super Saloons? They're really quite left field, but they their real advantage is that they come with that lovely naturally aspirated V8 that howls away sounds fantastic there's nothing like as talky as these supercharged or twin turbo v8s but who that's cares? the thing that's what that's why that's well me i'm afraid <laughs> because because you've got that mass and you have to be able to move it um mm. and you know with with those sorts of co- you know that's why you know that's why you know to me it's one of the rare occasions where i actually i'd rather have a turbocharged engine a good turbocharged engine um because even if you back, if we guess go back to Mercedes and the 63s, which used to be that 6.2 litre normally aspirated V8, and then they went over mm. to the 4 litre twin turbo V8. Um, and I can remember getting all a bit down on the chops about it and thinking, oh, God, they ruined it and it's turbocharged and everything else. But in fact, the car was just better because mm. the throttle response was still really good. It still made a ridiculous sound. But you didn't have to work quite so hard. And I don't want to have to work in those cars. Even though certain cars were, you know, Absolutely, I want to work around. I want, I want the revs to be singing and the thing to be howling. and wah, wah, wah. I want all that, but I don't want that in a super saloon. I just mm. want to go... Whoa. Yeah, I, I get that. For me, there's something about being in a big yeah, saloon a- car with an engine like that, thundering away in front of you, howling, yes. chasing yeah. the red line. I, I, yeah. I find that quite cool. But I, I That Lexus V8 is a fantastic engine, but it's in the wrong car. Yeah, it'd be good if it was in something lighter, wouldn't it? They've never, never put that thing yeah. in anything remotely light. It's... Always been in no. big, heavy cars. That's a good point. What about the... It's a shame, isn't it, Vauxhall VXR8, because of the, the death of the Australian car industry. Those cars just aren't going to be anymore. That's it. They're done. No. I mean, they're always a good... I'm going to sound fantastically patronising now, but they're always a good sort of meat and two veg value way into that kind of car, weren't they? And they look good. Um, and what I, what I did like about them is they did actually get the job done. They were, I mean, they were never sophisticated, but they weren't rubbish either at all. No, no. Um, and no, of course, I'd rather have an M5 or a, 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 an E63, but you know, they were whatever, double the money. Um, mm. And I, I just like cars that do things that other cars don't do. Um, and there was, you know, when those things were around, um, there was just nothing else like it. There's nothing else offering that level of performance for that kind of money. So, you know, I understand why they didn't sell very many because people don't want to spend even that amount of money on something with a Vauxhall badge, which you know, is, I, I, you know, I understand. Um, but cool car. Really cool car. Yeah, I've had a lot of fun in those things. Um, but talk to me about Bentleys. We've mentioned them before, but I want to hear about the Mulsan Turbo and the Turbo R. Um, I mean, well, see, this is the power. This is the, this is the power of the sort of super saloon. I mean, how long have you got? But um, I'll, I'll, I will keep it reasonably brief. You know, Bentley by when the 1970s turned into the 1980s, Bentley was basically gone. You know, if you bought a Bentley, a four percent of Rolls Royce production were Bentleys then, and you got a different radiator shell and you got different badges. Okay, and that is literally it. You know, if you, your handbook still said Rolls Royce on it, yeah. Cam cover still said Rolls Royce on them, I and they, they were not Bentleys in any um, conventional sense whatsoever. And you know, and and they were mindful of this, and they were thinking about just killing Bentleys because they weren't selling any. So they, they thought, what the point? And then, and then some, oh God, I can't remember who it was. Was it David Plasto? Somebody had the idea of thinking, well, you know, because turbocharging was reasonably well advanced by then. You know, there'd been a few on sale in the 1970s, and they thought, well, we've got this big old donkey. 
Um, putting a turbocharger on it will, would, you know, you'll get a lot more torque out of it. It'll actually quieten it down a bit. It might be quite an interesting thing to do. And so they made the Mulsanne Turbo in 1982. And it just turned everything around. And within a very small number of years, um, it had flipped completely on its head. And it was Rolls-Royce's turn to be, you know, butter fraction. You know, by the end of the... So 15 years later, when um, the companies got sold, and because Vickers owned both of them, and Rolls-Royce, uh, or the right to call a car, Rolls-Royce went to BMW, and the whole rest of the operation, including Bentley, went to Volkswagen. Um, you know, Rolls-Royce was, was about 4% of um, total output, and Bentleys were selling everything else. And it all started when they decided to make a super saloon. And they decided to make a performance Bentley. So if your brand is right, um, which Bentley's absolutely was for that treatment, then, you know, it can, ha it can literally have life-saving properties, which it did. Um, and I don't know if you've ever gone and driven a, you know, a sort of late 1980s Turbo R. I mean, they're not no. very good, but they have <clears> just <throat> got charm. They're just, to waft along in one of those, uh, yeah, just even thinking about it, because I'm for <laughs> years, but it just makes me happy. Just makes me happy. Just really good old-fashioned, you know, British, beautifully, beautifully crafted. Um, not terribly good, but yeah, just lovely things. Does the Bentley lineup look a bit incomplete without a big saloon car to sit above the Flying Spur? 100%, 100%, yeah. Um, you know, um, I, 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 they stopped the Mulsanne because, um, you know, I think, well, one reason certainly is that big old V8, it just, you know, it would have just been too expensive to get it through the next round of emissions. So, you know, the engine died and, the, and so the car dies with it. But now the Flying Spur, which is a fine car, that's their flagship, but they've got nothing um, that's going to worry, you know, Rolls Royce um, because it's, it's just in a different, it's just a different class of car now. Um, and, and you know, I, and I speak to people at Bentley, and you know, I think that they will replace it. It'll be all electric, mm. um, whatever does come there, which I think for that kind of car is probably sensible because if you think about what assets electric cars bring, they bring silence and they bring instant torque and that sort of thing. So. Uh, I think those are quite Bentley properties, so I think that could be good. But yeah, I mean, you, I mean, you would have done it. You would have, you know, you would, you, you would have got from a flying spur or something like that into a Mulsanne, and those Mulsannes, they were just different. Mm. They were built. I mean, I don't know how many much times longer they it took Bentley to build the Mulsanne compared to anything else that they made, but there was just a bespoke, handmade quality to them, which you just didn't get in anything else, um, and. You know, to me, that's as much part of Bentley as you know, as going fast, as winning Le Mans. It's that, it's that, it's those artisan talents and skills handed down the generations. Mm. Um, and you know, they make their modern cars really, really well. Um, but we know that they're based on Volkswagen platforms, um, and you know, I just hope that they create another properly handcrafted car again because i think in the long term it's actually important to the survival of the company because even though they may not make make many in terms of the halo effect the the way that we all just feel great about it it's, it's like gt3 rs isn't it it's like you know mm. people buy um cayennes and macans and that sort of thing because porsche make gt3 rs and they want that association well you know people will in future buy flying spurs and continental gts because bentley is still a, a bespoke sort of coach made um, company or, or it should be and so, they, yeah, they do need to replace the Mulsanne. Yeah, the Mulsanne was always a very tangible link back to the pre-Volkswagen Group days, wasn't it? Where, yeah. Where, yeah, where they were their own thing and they were a remarkable machine. And that engine, the fact that the engine was still going, was it 50 years after it was introduced, something like that? Incredible, really. Um, uh, 60. 60. 1959. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, in the, in the, the, the S2 Bentley it came in. Yeah, incredible. Um, it's frustrating when you talk about fast four doors because something like an Aston Martin Rapide or a Porsche Panamera, they absolutely qualify, except that they don't have four doors, they have five. And that they just sort of complicate things for journalists oh, like blimey. us. Oh, blimey. Yeah, well, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, okay, Panamera, I mean, that feels like a sort of four door coupe to me or five door coupe to me but something like a rapide i don't know i don't know why a rapide feels more like a more, more like a saloon to me i think it, i think it's because it's the proportions isn't it because it is quite long and quite thin mm -hmm. um that sort of feels like it to me but you're right it, it does complicate the issue but i think th i think the secret to that is just don't dwell on it if it works for you it works 
Yeah, actually, do you know what? I, I can't remember if an Aston Rapide did have a hatchback boot or a saloon boot. Off the top of your head, do you know? I might have to look this up. <laughs> Fill for a minute. It, shouldn't I? I'm just gonna. I'm well, just googling this. Uh, no, it is a hatch. It is a hatch. Oh, there we go. It oh, is a hatch. It is a hatch. <laughs> oh, we're good at this, aren't we? Um, right. Well, just to round out this episode, then you've mentioned uh, ele an electric Bentley, and actually, I ref I think that. There are some categories of car that we worry for as the switch to electric happens. We worry about lightweight sports cars. We worry about hot yep. hatches. But I suppose the sports saloon, particularly the super saloon, they're going to handle the switch to electrification quite happily, aren't they? They're not going to be upset by that well, at all, apart from the soundtrack issue. Which is an issue. Mm -hmm. um, I, I hope that they get better at managing the power delivery of electric cars. You know, if you get into even something like a Taycan, if it's mm. a quick one, you know, a Turbo or a Turbo S, they're still kind of a bit wham bam, aren't they? There's no sense of it building. Um, and you know, I understand why that is because it makes you know, if you just go from nothing to everything instantly, you get a you, know, you get a pretty amazing numbers out of the car. Um, but I, I would just like them to be a bit more progressive, um, and I'm sure that they could program that into it. But you know, the powertrain thing is still a big thing. Mm. You know, they've got to try and find a way of injecting some kind of character into electric motors. Um, and I don't know how you do that without, you know, synthesizing the sound, which obviously they could easily do. And in fact, you know, most modern cars, certainly most modern expensive exotic cars, have some form of sound synthesis on them, don't they? Mm. Um, mm. So maybe it's not such a leap. But yeah, I mean, in terms of the... Um, the weight issue will be you know, less significant. Um, they will have all that torque, which, as we discussed, is pretty key to those cars. But I'm still struggling to see how they're going to be as good as, let alone better than. Um, we haven't talked about, you know, things like um, I guess it's you know we think of it as an estate, don't we? But something like an RS6. But you know, that to me is an absolutely titanic um, car, and I just don't know how you're going to go back, you know, recapturing that. That's that feel, that sense, that spirit mm. with an electric car. Um, I'm, I'm just not not excited about it. I'm afraid. Well, we'll but have to I, get you. you know, I'd, I would love to be proven wrong. Yeah, well, you, you'll have to have a go in an Audi RS e-tron GT. I've not had a go yet, but maybe there'll be something to be learnt from driving that car. Um, good. Okay. But it's, a, but it's a Taycan, isn't it? it? Well, yeah. There we go. So we're, yeah, we can probably guess what it's like, really. Um, there we go, sports saloons, super saloons. I, I've learned a lot today. I hope you listening have as well. Um, that's a good topic, isn't it? Well, let's leave that one there, Andrew. Um, we will have to dream up another topic for next week um, and we'll be back to talk to you all then. Look forward to it. Thank you, one Bye, and everyone. Cheers. Cheers.